Indo Sheik. We spoke about Indo Sheik. Now let's look at the difference, different ways in which Indo Sheik manifested itself in the 90s. And we speak about henna, bindis, saris, and bangalas. Indian fashions in the West is the topic of this unit of module 7 on Indo Sheik. Hindu imagery, some, uh, a young woman called Tanisha Ram Chandran says that over the past two decades, with the expression, explosion of all things yoga, Hindu imagery has become part of an Indo Sheik marketing trend, which has seen the mass production of henna, bindis, yoga mats, and sari esque merchandise for Western consumption. Lunch boxes, Night lights and T-shirts with the likenesses of Hindu gods are popular bestsellers. Now we'll not go into the question of what is the, what, how does the Indian community receive these uh, appropriations of Hindu symbols in the, in everyday merchandise. We'll come to that later. But let's look at first observe the trend how Indo Sheik found itself, and what were the different ways in which. Indo Sheik became visible. What were the most visible signifier of Indo Sheik in the West? From saris to mehendi, the Indo craze catches on. And a 14 year old girl in Los Angeles Times in talks, says, reports this phenomenon in 1997. She says, Walking through a trendy boutique in a mall in the valley, I'm reminded of when I was a little girl and I wrapped myself in the golden rich colors of my grandmother's brocade saris, soft silk saris. I see bright red dots called bindis, not wrapped in little cards in the sweet smelling Indian shops of my childhood, but crowded together in a neon lit showcase with chokers, cheap jewelry, colorful hair dyes, and other trendy accessories. Flipping through a popular keen teen magazine, I see a model's hands delicately painted with mehndi, I see lush Indian fabrics cut into skimpy dresses and worn beneath crunch denim overalls. And I see more and more of my American friends wearing toe rings just for fun. It's strange seeing the clothes and styles that I always thought of as so beautiful and unique to my heritage now considered so fashionable and exotic. So this 14-year-old girl, Meera Rangachar, who is quoted and who writes a, an article in Los Angeles Times, is totally flummoxed as to how everyday objects from her childhood are now considered so fashionable in the US. And this picture is of one such place that Meera speaks about. Uh, it's not of 1997, but it's 2011 in a small a kind of store that she describes in Mannheim. And we have a young woman uh, buying bangles in Indian merchandise in this store in Mannheim. Among, it was not just the ordinary people. The reason why this trend, the Indo Sheik trend, caught on was courtesy celebrities and one of the first celebrities to have spotted bindis, even though that honor is now given to Madonna, uh, was Glenn Stephanie. It's Glenn, Glenn Stephanie who is believed to have set the trend by wearing bindis in the fashion of Indian brides, as you can see in this picture below. And she has the chandan which an Indian bride wears uh, with, uh, on her bridal night. She is spotting that with, with a very western kind of bob uh, hairstyle and appropriate and uh, use it, uses it as an accessory in her own performance. Now the reason why Stephanie was converted to Indian style, the st real story is given by Nanya Mukherjee who says that somewhere around 1995 the band no doubt with its energetic effervescent Cutely, just a girl, Gwen Stephanie, hit MTV hard and not in hearts everywhere, hard in the mid 90s. 
And the story was that she was dating an Indian guy. The guitarist was an Indian Californian boy called Tony Canals and was the love of Gwen's life for quite a few years until he dumped her uh, just before the production of their mega hit album, Breaking Her Heart. And according to Ananya, consequently, every song on the album is written about their breakup and her heartbreak. She moved on eventually to that guy from Bush, but her sexual emotional brush with the East remained significant. It was there in everything, but more visibly it was there in her fashion, in her ever-present bindi, and in the expensive saris she wrapped around her waist, sarong style, matched with the little bustier in all her performances. So it's thanks to her um, relationship with her guitarist of Indian descent that Stephanie sports the bindi and tattoos which become a fashion trend because of her popularity in the popular in among the US teens and among global teens bindi becomes a fashion statement. Uh, from Stephanie let's move on to the queen Madonna Madonna it was it was a while the trend for sporting henna and bindis had begun earlier, it was Madonna spotting her bindi and henna in her music video in her album Frozen, uh, in her in the number Frozen in the album Ray of Light in 1998, which brought the body adornments worn by Indian women to the western eye, which made them visible. So here we have Madonna in Frozen um, uh, spotting a bindi and a henna, which said which made it a Raised in the West. So Madonna and Henna, due to the iconic status enjoyed by the music star, young Western women began to spot bindis and henna at hands and tattoos. These items, which have spe special ritual connotations in India, were have been appropriated by the Western fashion industry. And as you can see in this image, uh, uh, Madonna, like Stephanie, wears the bindi spotted by the bride, but she also wears a tilak, uh, the, 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 the tilak which, uh, which uh, invited a lot of ayah and wrath of the purists who felt that she had um, desacralized uh, Hindu ritual images or Hindu religious images by wearing this to her performance, one of the awards nights performance where she spotted a bindi and came in for sharp criticism. Uh, the latest person, latest uh, celebrity to join the trend for uh, bindi is Selena Gomez, whose big sexy post breakup, post breakers performance at the NTV Music Awards uh, was the new single Come and Get It uh, was considered incredible by Britney Spears, there was just one flaw in her performance, which was between her perfect eyebrows. And what was this flaw, which actually enhanced her looks was a bindi, which came in this time for the ire of the president of the Uni Universal Society of Hinduism, Rajan Z. The bindi on the forehead in an, is an ancient tradition in Hindustan and has religious significance. So he explained that the auspicious religious symbol traditionally worn by married women at the site of the sixth chakra should not be thrown around loosely or for consumer fashion. So this appropriation of the bindi, which has a ritual significance is worn by married Hindu women, uh, supported by Western celebrities, comes in for a lot of criticism by purists, by uh, leaders of Hinduism, so Hindu societies and so on. Uh, Selena is asked to apologize and then she should get acquainted with the basics of world religion. So this exotic look is complete with the Hindi, uh, with the bindi and the belly dancer kind of outfit that she's sporting here, uh, the jewelry she sports here. But however, Zed praised Julia Roberts when she wore a in bindi during a visit to the Taj Mahal in 2009 while, while filming Eat, Pray, Love. According to him, Julia Roberts honored the traditions of India, India by spotting a bindi on her forehead during her recent trip to India and we are ha very happy she did. It was a mark of respect that hasn't gone unnoticed, he said then. I would personally like to extend an, extend an invitation to Ms. Roberts 
and her family to visit with me if the trip to India has sparked an interest in Hinduism and other Hindu leaders in America would be glad to share their knowledge. So, uh, while uh, he has uh, been approving of uh, Julia Roberts's sporting Hindu symbols, others haven't been as com has sympathetic and Roberts also has come in for a similar criticism of appropriating Hindu symbols. And the final nail in the coffin is put by Beyonce in her uh, album in, in Coldplay, in Coldplay's new video, him for the weekend, uh, two decades after uh, the craze for Windy appeared in the West, when Beyonce spotted the Bollywood heroine look, complete with the coal eye lined eyes, nose ring and bridal, headband, henna hands and sequin attire, in Coldplay's new video, him for the weekend, allegedly inspired by India's vibrant hues and mysticism, romanticized Bollywood images of India that had already infiltrated the global popular cultural imaginary. So you can already see a difference in Beyonce's look. It's, it's no different from that of a Bollywood heroine. And this idea of mixing this mysticism with Bollywood quiche is complete in this representation of Indian uh, uh, of Indian style or Indian uh, uh, nose ring, coal eyes, everything where unlike the earlier images where it was a source, where it was mapped on to religious identities here, Bollywood meets Hinduism in the production of this kishi exoticized image of India in the in the video him to him for the weekend, which is again, been very sharply criticized by people who have watched the video. Hollywood star Jessica Simpson is, the, is uh, also another one who has joined the bandwagon by uh, where she started, when she started shooting for a television uh, com documentary and turned up uh, when went to Mumbai, she turned all cultural. She was spotted wearing a traditional bindi and a henna tattoo on her palms. And she attended the Bollywood bash while she was in the country filming her reality show, The Price of Beauty. So from Hina and Bindi, let's move on to the saris because the trend for the sari was go evil. In the 90s, the sari turned up in the most unlikely places. In fact, the Bindi, the Hina and the sari seem to have, turn, have turned up in the most unlikely places the MTV Music Award. MTV, which is a symbol of youth. MTV is a symbol of uh, a youth, hip, cool culture. This is the place where ritual in Hindu religious symbols and Indian traditional attire turns shows itself. When Naomi Campbell, a top model, turns up at the M MTV Music Awards in Radio City Music Hall, New York, this is a later image, of course. I couldn't find that image of 1990s. This was followed by the sari fad. The henna and the bindi and the nose ring fad was followed by the sari fad when several well known Western figures such as Elizabeth Hurley, Sherry Blair, Oprah Winfrey were seen wearing saris in public functions. And here we have Elizabeth Hurley, who was then engaged to be married to an Indian Arunayar wearing, sporting a sari and looking uh, resplendent in an Indian sari. But when political figures like the first lady, Michelle Obama, uh, wears a sari, she is making a different kind of statement. She is making not a cool key statement, not a style statement, but it's uh, she is um, paying uh, obeisance, even if it's a lip service, but she's paying obeisance to this, the, the new multicultural ethic that America seems to be, the US and different parts of Europe seem to be embracing by, uh, by making a concession to her dressing, using, wearing, in, she doesn't go all Indian, all they see by wearing a sari, but which is a compromise by wearing a shift dress, which uses Indian prints. 
So she chose a silk shift dress by Mumbai born New York designer Naeem Khan, deftly commanding a western silhouette with a skirt embellished in exotic silk and embroidery that would not have looked out of place on a Rajasthani Maharaja. This is not that uh, uh, outfit, I couldn't get that image, but this is another image of Michelle Obama and the President uh, Obama uh, attending a Diwali function. Uh, in UK, again, the nod to multiculturalism is again made sartorially when the Prime Minister Cameron's wife takes her cue from Indian style when she accompanied her husband on a visit to the Sri Swami Narayan Mandir, the Hindu temple in northwest London to celebrate Diwali. So from Diwali in US to Diwali in UK, we have the first ladies sporting Indian saris. Discarding her signature pare down urban yummy mummy style, Samantha Cameron wore a russet silk sari with an ornate jacquard woven gold border design, which apparently was borrowed from a friend. Draping seven yards of material around the female body, female form may sound a challenge, but it's second nature to millions of women who go on about their daily lives in traditional Indian attire. So for Mrs. Cameron to model this textile version of origami is what the papers reported on her fashion conscious frame was a bold and brave decision for a political photo position. Indian fashions from the shawls and stoles of the Raj and tie and dye skirts of the hippie flower day, bow days to the sarong skirts of 1990, India has intrigue the western world, but the new Indo chic is different as I said from the Indo chic of the 60s or the flower parties of the 60s. Uh, this is different because of the emergence of what Gaultier calls global village chic. Uh, uh, Galliano Gaultier Christian Lacroix are masters at avant-garde fashion. On the pages of Vogue, uh, Gautier displays what the magazine's editors call the global village chic. So ethnic becomes chic, ethnic becomes fashionable. Global uh, ethnicity and rusticity is now at the service of a global fashion industry which consumes it and markets it and brands it as global village chic which is lapped up by consumers across the world. And what does this global village say con consist of? A model with an Indian rose nose ring and many like tattoos on her body, wearing African jewelry and a thoroughly American graffiti scroll bustier and leggings. So this is a fusion of Indian motives with uh, American attire, which creates uh, which creates a new look for the U.S., which is called global village chic. Undoubtedly, that year Asian influences have dominated. This year, that year we're talking about 1990s, have dominated the international fashion scene, perhaps owing to the rush of Hollywood films set in Asia. But the question is whether these designs are just the flavor of the month or a definite trend in Western fashion. Beginning in 1997 and continuing into the mid-2000, Southeast Asian and Indian fashion began to influence and gain greater recognition from the global media due to the establishment of the Fashion Design Council of India and the hosting of Indian India Fashion Week in Delhi. Inspired by Bollywood cinema and a resurgence of interest in 1970s fashion, designers in India adapted and repurposed traditional garments like the sari, churidar and kurta into the anarkali ball gown from the 1990s onwards. By the late 90s, kurta tunics were turned into short dresses and Manish Arora designed garish Hindu god printed t-shirts for both locals and to global tourists. British, Asian and American designers also incorporated ethnic chic cloth such as khadi, 
face lay silk or Indonesian batik into western inspired clothing patterns such as shirts and blouses featuring traditional embroidery. These clothings were worn not only by the immigrant Bangladeshi, Pakistani and Indian diaspora in Britain, but also by non-Indian women. And the most visible way, so uh, apart, you, uh, as for the use of the occasional sari when one is making a style statement, say at the NTV Music Awards or uh, at uh, when one is making a political statement such as when the first ladies showed up in saris at Hindu festivals, uh, Indian uh, signifiers or Indian fashions or Indian uh, Hindu religious symbols or Indian uh, motives and Indian embroidery mainstreamed into Western fashion through the sporting of henna and bindi by Western celebrities and popular cultural icons like Madonna and Stephanie and also by the incorporation of Indian fabrics, Indian motives and Indian embroidery by the top fashion houses and by the top fashion designers in Europe and North America. Bits and pieces of Indian style are increasingly being embroidered into the Western fashion world, reported a newspaper. In a bizarre east waist embrace, churidars and mehndi, nose rings and anklets are teaming up with lingerie and leather motorcycle jackets in collections such as by designers such as Jean Paul Gauthier, Oscar de la Renta and Mary McFadden. Uh, St. Laurent, Lagerfeld, Armani, Bean, Blas, Lauren, Klein, Kamali, Gigli, McFadden have all made sequin and jeweled embroidery from India a permanent part of their evening wear collection. So, India can be uh, consumed only in bits and pieces as embellishments on the forehead, on the palms or as embroidery on evening wear. India is a country which has been a source of great inspiration to me, especially Rajasthan. There is an extraordinary sense of colour in the clothing, said Oscar de la Renta. McFadden also gleans inspiration from India's Hindu powers, Hindu icons, Mughal architecture and Islamic calligraphy. Cashing in on this fascination, many US based Indians are making a tidy sum by aliasing with Indian craftsmen for fashion pundits abroad. Increasingly, the influence of India's colours and cuts can be seen on Western styles as you can see in this outfit. The influence is reflected mostly in beaded evening wear and brightly colored resort wear. Indian colors such as hot pink, paprika and saffron continue to be popular colors year in and year out. So, Indian colors and cuts. And now we come, if we uh, were to think that uh, Indo chic is a gendered phenomena uh, embraced only by western women in Europe and America, we would uh, we would be uh, we would be surprised to find that as far as cuts are concerned, it's not just the women, but Indian fashions have also been incorporated in cuts for men. And even as Nehru jackets and Jodhpurs remain staples of the fashion world, designers such as Armani and McFadden have turned to the silk sleek silhouette of the churidars this year. Whether it be the Churidar or the Kashmiri Firan, the stamp of these top notch designers is evident on many of the fashions publicized in upmarket stores such as Nyman Marcus, Bloomingdale's, and Saks Fifth Avenue. Now, the question we need to ask is what does it mean when white people? sport non-white attire, the Goras or the Kalas as we have seen sporting Indian attire, what does it mean? What does it mean? Does it mean that they are in love with India? 
or in love with the Indians, which gets them to switch over to Indian symbols or Indian styles, or there's something more than that. Is it love or is it appropriation? That's the question we need to ask ourselves. A blogger who calls herself Gori Girl, which translates into White Girl, wrote, when I read that a Westerner in a sari is committing the sin of cultural appropriation, I got more than a little offended. Isn't the intent more important than the outside opinion? How is my admiration and love of the sari an insult to anyone? How is something so positive turned by some people into a negative? Uh, as people all over the world turn aside from the traditional wear in favor of the western uniform of jeans and t-shirts, as we see in India, which has become like a uniform for the youth, shouldn't be an occasion of joy to see that their cultural heritage is being is treasured by people on the outside of their culture, she asked. How exactly is it that a non-Westerner can go between the different styles of dress, but a Westerner cannot? Is this not a double standard and is this truly acceptable? Now, Jessica Fraser has an answer. She says that when you wear a sari, it's laden with unwritten language. The way you tie it, the length, the fabric, the way the palu is draped over one's shoulder, the underblouse, the accessories, the posture. And the Hindu community, she says, is very good at letting people into their space and letting them borrow their cultural goods, as long as it's done respectfully. respectfully. But I've never worn one for work or even to a function hosted by Hindus. I prefer to wear an Indian scarf or some jewelry as a mark of respect. Uh, in order to understand how fashions work or how clothing works, let's go back to Elizabeth Roos who says clothing is not a random or totally individual affair, it is a social activity. The overall pattern of our dress, be it grass skirts or tailored clothes, is a consequence of the society in which we live, she says. We cannot interpret the clothing of other societies. We cannot understand their significance if we have not learned the code. So clothing, like everything else, is a code which needs to be learned. There are strict codes of dress for the wearing of traditional clothes. The type of fabric, the colors, the type of design or pattern on the fabric, the length of sleeves, the way a sash is tied, all act as signs and social meanings, like we saw in the case of the bindi or the henna, which is born, normally worn by, uh, uh, by a bride or only on festive occasions. Uh, or the bindi which is uh, used as a Hindu symbol, the, they are all acts which are, they all act as signs and social meanings and they cannot be this decontextualized from where they belong and taken somewhere else as fashion statements. Now, uh, just to brush everyone's memory, the western passion for Indian fashion can be traced back to the Raj. Fashion's flirtation with ethnic looks has traditionally been to give a sense of the exotic. When staid Victorian ladies wrapped a paisley shawl around a crillinal and bustle, they were letting the heat and color of India into their rigidly cage clothing. So it begins then. But there's also been a reverse uh, appropriation because apparently the choli, the sari blouse, was introduced by puritanical uh, whites. Uh, in the 1870s, Annette Croyd, an unmarried British woman who uh, came, to in, came to Calcutta and found uh, Bengali women, she was, it was uh, Annette Croyd who introduced them to the Choli. Who, uh, so the Choli is entirely a Western introduction into the Indian sari. As with the consumption of Indian style by white American youth, the recreation of hip hop by Asian American youth suggests that as commodities cross cultural and national boundaries, the deflections, rejections and subversions that can take place at each point in the economic cycle of production, exchange, consumption have to be grounded in particular relationships between the local and the global. That is in a specific instances of cross-cultural consumption. 
So, we this desire, we I close with this idea from bell hooks, the idea of eating the other. The desire for the transformation through the other is not unique to fashion, she says. It is connected to a much longer history of what Beck black feminist scholar bell hooks calls imperialist nostalgia, the longing of whites to inhabit, if only for a time, the world of the other. Bodily transcendence through sartorial or cosmetic play is enacted by the consumption of otherness, a courageous consumption in Hooke's words because it is about conquering the fear of racial difference and acknowledging power. It is by eating the other, Hooke explains that one asserts power and privilege. So, with this I leave you to think about what whether one should feel jubilant about the invasion, uh, the henna and bindi invasion of the West or is there ca cause for concern about the appropriation of Hindu symbols or Muslim sim uh, Islamic symbols by the West to satisfy its own consumerist desires as style statements or a, a, at a more deeper level this other consumption of otherness it's about it's about conquering the fear of racial difference so once again it feeds into this western desire to conquer the fear of the other and to acknowledge one's own power by dressing as the other by eating the other by consuming the other so it's in this light we conclude that the consumption of uh, indian uh, styles such as henna, bindi, saris and badgalas should be seen as part of this drive to eat the other through which the European self asserts one's power and privilege. From this we will actually move on to literally eating the other through consuming the other's food in the next unit of this module. <laughs>